Okay, well, this has been a fascinating session, uh, a lot of uh, new technologies. And um, so for this last one, I have the obligation to uh, introduce this, uh, not hardly introducing it, I'm just sort of uh, reviewing one of the uh, great uh, breakthroughs of uh, science uh, and technology and electronics, and that's the uh, double heterostructure uh, concept. Uh, now, uh, I'll explain what the double heterostructure is, but first I want to give credit, of course, to the people who invented this. And so uh, the Nobel Committee finally uh, uh, gave Nobel Prize in 2000. This is for an idea that was first published in 1963. So it's uh, 37 years uh, before they got around to honoring it. And it is certainly a, a very gigantic thing uh, which enables uh, many different technologies. Uh, simultaneously done in the Soviet Union and in the uh, USA. And uh, uh, Zoris Alfarov, uh, the Nobel laureate from uh, St. Petersburg, he credits his coworker, uh, Rudy uh, Kazarinov, uh, for actually uh, uh, introducing him to the idea. Uh, now, so I'm going to explain why do we need a double heterostructure and what great things does it do. So I fall back to chemistry. And in chemistry, if you remember it, uh, you have uh, two molecules, let's say the hydrogen molecule, and then uh, when the two levels interact, they repel each other, and one becomes an antibonding orbital, and the other becomes a bonding orbital, and the bonding orbital is the chemical bond. Now, the problem is if you have a dangling bond, that is to say if there is no chemistry, uh, then you just le you're left with the original energy level and a non-bonding orbital and it's right in the middle. Now, this difference between the anti-bonding and the bonding, we can think of it as being like a, a semiconductor band gap. So if all we have left is the non-bonding orbitals, this is a problem because it leaves uh, energy levels uh, right in mid-gap. So uh, these mid-gap levels are uh, uh, the biggest problem in semiconductors because uh, they can capture an electron and then they can capture a hole and an electron and a hole. So in other words, they act as a catalyst for electron hole recombination, which is extremely destructive to the function of a uh, semiconductor. Uh, so it's a catalyst, but it's a bad catalyst. It's for something that you don't want to have happen. So we have to prevent dangling bonds as best we can. And so uh, typically what happens at surfaces, this is the biggest problem in semiconductors. Uh, let's say you have a fabulous semiconductor uh, and, and it's very pure and it's the structurally perfect and so on, but it, it has uh, all these dangling bonds on the surface. So the surface is effectively completely loaded with uh, defects relative to the uh, volume. Now, if you're doing this at an interface, it's the same story. Uh, the, uh, if you have an interface between two rather different materials, uh, they won't necessarily uh, line up and you'll be left with lots of dangling bonds at, at the interface. And think of the dangling bonds as being an impurity. And you know, even if you have uh, bulk purity, which is very, very high, it uh, doesn't mean anything. It has to be chemically and structurally perfect, uh, which means that no internal dangling bonds either. But it's the surf surfaces that are the most severe problem. So the history of electronics is a history of reducing the uh, surface or interfacial defect density. And so you go back to the very first uh, transistor of 1947. And back then, the concept of an emitter and a collector really meant something. The emitter really emitted uh, carriers, and the collector really collected carriers. And, uh, and the base was really the base on which the whole thing was based. Well, uh, they, it was very lucky that these first experiments were done on germanium uh, because uh, germanium, al although it has uh, quite a few defects on the surface, it has fewer defects than other semiconductors. And by some stroke of luck, uh, the defect density was just low enough that the electrons, uh, or the holes in this case, could run the gauntlet of all these defects and successfully make it over to the collector. And uh, so that uh, was a kind of a lucky break that enabled them to invent this is the bipolar transistor, which is actually uh, uh, infinitely more subtle than the, uh, uh, than the field effect transistor, which was invented actually uh, uh, 20 years earlier. Uh, now, suppose I had come along and I, as a time traveler, and I would say, oh, folks, you're working on the wrong material. It, it's not going to turn out to be germanium. I'm going to give you the material of the future, and I hand them a silicon wafer. 
And if I would do that, I would have uh, set back the progress of electronics by a huge amount because uh, this uh, small density of uh, surface, de or relatively small density of surface defects on germanium does not exist on silicon uh, without, and, and it took a long time to get it to exist on silicon. So they would never have uh, discovered the uh, bipolar transistor and the field would not have taken off and we'd still be using vacuum tubes today. Uh, fortunately, I am not a time traveler, so they, so they went ahead and they succeeded with this. But the reason they succeeded is luck is that it just happened that the surface of germanium had few enough defects. Uh, but uh, as and then they, the great success then led people to figure out uh, not just that you should oxidize silicon, but they figured out a recipe. And it took 20 years later, they finally had a recipe for oxidizing the silicon. You know, there are many ways of oxidizing silicon, and, uh, but there's a specific way that leaves you with uh, a uh, very small uh, density of uh, defects. And uh, in fact, uh, if you do it right, and, and doing it right took 20 years to figure out how to do it, uh, but you can get 99.999% uh, yield of uh, perfect uh, uh, non-dangling bonds, no, perfect covalent bonds at the interface between silicon and silicon dioxide. And uh, every time uh, you come up with something like this that gets rid of the defects on surfaces, it seems like you create a revolution in electronics. So I, I said germanium, of course, that was the basis of electronics for many years. Uh, and as soon as this was discovered, then silicon uh, became uh, the basis of electronics, and then eventually became the basis of integrated circuits and the basis of computing. So this little material science breakthrough is actually a big deal. Now, uh, the, uh, the, there are uh, people who actually discovered the recipe, uh, uh, like uh, Andrew Grove, went on to become uh, the founders of Intel. And so it, it was rather a big deal. Now, I, I know some people who were there at Intel in the very early days, and they told me what it was like, that this was a, a well-kept secret. And what they did is when they reached this point in fabricating the integrated circuits, everybody was told to leave the lab and go take a coffee break. And there were only three people in the company who actually knew the recipe. Okay, and so that is uh, a little bit, uh, uh, well, that's exactly how it was actually back then. It was kind of a big secret. Uh, and, uh, but now it's a well-known secret, because why? Because they have, in, in Silicon Valley, they have bars, they have places where people meet after work, and eventually it leaked out. But the, the, the gentleman I spoke with uh, from Intel from the early days, he sort of thought that they kept the secret for about 10 years, and it appears maybe they kept it for only about five years before other companies came in. So this is a, a rather remarkable thing. So uh, of equal re uh, amazing importance, is another thing. You see, most of the good things come from accidents from nature. So there's an accident in nature that the lattice constant of aluminum arsenide and gallium arsenide is uh, uh, within one-tenth one of a percent. So uh, it, it's just an accident that they're so close because the aluminum atom is a lot smaller than the gallium atom. Nonetheless, it just works out that they're uh, within one-tenth of a percent. And what that means is that if you grow these uh, layers, uh, you'll get all the chemical bonds matching at the interfaces. And if they match, you'll have very few defects. You don't have zero defects because the match is not perfect, but you could get about 10 to the 10 defects per square centimeter. And if I, if I go back to the silicon, uh, you can get maybe 10 to the 9 defects per square centimeter in silicon. These are very low defect densities corresponding to uh, a, a extremely high uh, probability of having uh, perfect uh, covalent bonds. So uh, this uh, idea of making a sandwich between a wider band gap and a narrower band gap uh, solves the problem because uh, the electrons stay in, the, in, the, in their potential well, the holes stay in their potential well, they never see the external surfaces, uh, and so uh, you end up uh, with uh, what this technology ended up uh, being the basis of optical communication, light emitting diodes, uh, and solar cells, just like making a very good interface on silicon uh, was the basis of our whole uh, uh, computer industry and computer sciences. So if you ask what does electronics really need, it needs a chemical yield of perfect covalent bonds uh, with extremely perfect, uh, maybe uh, less than a part per million of defective bonds on the uh, surface. 
Now, uh, j just to give you an idea of uh, what's going on and sort of the relationship between electronics and chemistry, I like to tease the chemists because the chemists are so proud they have so many big molecules and they say, we have more molecules and bigger molecules than you have. And then I say, well, here is a silicon wafer. It's completely covalently bonded. And in principle, when I create an electron hole pair in, this, uh, uh, in the silicon wafer, in principle, the wave function occupies the whole wafer. Well, it doesn't really, but it occupies a very big area. And uh, so in effect, each semiconductor wafer, you can think of it as a giant uh, covalent molecule as long as you don't have uh, those defects present. So as you uh, go through the periodic table of the elements, uh, it, it just worked out this great accident. I don't think we, uh, we should claim credit how brilliant everybody is, uh, but you have gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide uh, were, um, uh, just happen to have the same lattice constant. But then as the field developed, uh, th this particular chart this is a, a very famous chart of all the lattice matched uh, semiconductors. You see there are quite a few of them that are lattice matched uh, that uh, will, uh, different alloys. So it's, it's very easy to replace gallium with aluminum. It's the same valence, so you can make uh, uh, an arbitrary alloy like that. And, and the, the semiconductor is perfectly happy. The interfaces are perfectly happy because they are uh, lattice matched. And you have uh, quite a few elements to choose from. So you go down to indium and so forth. So this covers everything from visible uh, uh, light emitting diodes to things that are uh, in the infrared, for example, where optical fibers have very little absorption. So the double heterostructure uh, actually then I'll show, it turns out to be the basis of all of these devices and, and uh, including uh, well, we, we have the semiconductor laser. This is the basis of all our long distance communication. So we definitely use it every day, even if we're not aware of it. Uh, the LED, the gallium nitride LED, we turn on lights on at home. Uh, the solar cell, uh, well, there's some, at this point, there is a certain small percentage blend of uh, photovoltaic energy when you, uh, when you uh, use electricity, uh, especially here in California and many other places. Okay, so uh, let me, uh, sort of illustrate how the double heterostructure helps in each of these cases. Oh, first I have to sort of uh, show it. That, so this is the double heterostructure. It's simply a combined potential well for electrons and a potential well for holes, so that they're both trapped. Now, why is this useful for a laser? So to have gain in a laser, there is a requirement that is very easy to derive that you need a lot of carriers. You need the electrons and holes to be very close together and you don't want them running away and you don't want them recombining at uh, surfaces and interfaces. Uh, so it's actually uh, quite easy to prove that you need uh, 2 times 10 to the 18 carriers per cu cubic centimeter and that gives you gain. That's a lot of carriers and you need both of them. You need both electrons and holes. So you create this potential well. That's the white layer in the middle and uh, that potential well keeps the carriers away from the surfaces and uh, that's the main requirement. Now, back in the early days, uh, Herb Cromer, he was very proud that it also fulfilled a second requirement, and that is it created a slightly higher refractive index in the uh, potential well, because it's a different material, it's gallium arsenide. Uh, it created a slightly higher refractive index, which uh, created light uh, index guided uh, mode guiding, and that was uh, rather regarded as a big deal back in the early days. Uh, but we've already heard that uh, we don't really use index guiding anymore. We have pixels. We have various ways of making optical cavities. So the real fundamental thing is just in, as in the other parts of solid state electronics, it's keeping the carriers away from all those dangling bonds at the uh, surfaces. So uh, this is kind of a, a, a physics idea. It won a Nobel Prize, okay, but you use it every day. I, I assume everyone here is going to check their email in case something important came in. Uh, maybe you'll download some web pages and you might call someone. And, and it, in all those cases, you will be using uh, Herb Cromer's idea, which is uh, quite amazing. I should mention something I was involved with, and that was uh, uh, introducing strain into the, uh, into the lasers. And the strain idea is very simple. Uh, if you have a normal semiconductor, the heavy holes and the light holes are degenerate, and uh, so the heavy holes dominate. And so the holes are heavyweight, uh, the, elec uh, the electrons are lightweight, and this is rather unfavorable for uh, getting lasing action. Uh, but if you put a little strain on, you lift the degeneracy and you push the light holes uh, slightly up, 
and the, then you're lasing to uh, light holes, and this uh, lowers the carrier density required uh, for lasing, and it's very easy to get the strain. Let me uh, go back a couple of slides to show that. And you can see that if you go vertically on this chart, you have no strain, but if you go slightly horizontally, so for example, uh, uh, if you have uh, uh, gallium arsenide with a little bit of indium, it changes the band gap ever so slightly, and that gives you the type of strain that you need to uh, lift the degeneracy of the light holes and the heavy holes, and thereby uh, make the lasers work better. So almost all the lasers are now strained. Uh, so that's the benefit of the double heterostructure for the laser and for everyday life. I'll mention the light emitting diode. Uh, here, the reason why you want a double heterostructure is you want to get, just keep the carriers away from the exterior surfaces because you don't want them to go into uh, the energy to go into heat. You want the energy to go into light. And indeed, uh, gallium nitride LEDs can be 90% efficient. That's kind of a, a record gallium nitride LED. Uh, the more uh, common ones you can buy uh, probably in the, uh, from various uh, companies you can buy for your home, 60, uh, maybe 50, 60, 70% efficient LEDs. So the gallium nitride is uh, quite uh, amazing in this regard. And indeed, the efficiency is very high. Uh, it is amazingly high. And uh, I will show you uh, this film of gallium arsenide. I actually brought one of these films with me. Uh, this is a double heterostructure film, and the luminescent efficiency, uh, you, you can see this. This is actually being used. I'll, I'll show this again during the solar cell part, but uh, this is actually a double heterostructure, and the internal luminescence efficiency is rather amazing. At room temperature, 99.9% .9 efficiency, and uh, measured at 130 Kelvin, 99.9. Uh, .9, so the, you, it's, it's getting ridiculously high internal efficiency, and certainly compet uh, competitive with rare earths, uh, the best of which is ytterbium. So uh, these are the reasons why you need a double heterostructure for LEDs. Now, for the solar cell, it's a similar idea. Uh, the solar cell will ultimately be uh, the, the, uh, all the primary energy of mankind will come from solar cells because the cost keeps going down. And you can see from the version I have here, it's uh, hardly more than a piece of paper. It's completely flexible. And if you uh, look closely at this, you see it's picking up the dim room lights. We have dim indoor lights. And uh, nonetheless, there's enough light here to light up the blue LEDs on top. Can the people in the back row see the blue LEDs? OK, you can come up afterward and have a look. OK. Uh, so uh, the double heterostructure becomes uh, very important in photovoltaic cells. It, but it was originally applied to lasers and LEDs, and it was a long time. It was literally decades before the double heterostructure was recognized as being essential for uh, solar cells. And I should mention that the buildup of the carrier density is very important because uh, log of the carrier density translates to voltage. So you want to get the highest voltage and the highest performance. And yes, it's all based on the same double heterostructure. Now, uh, so people are sometimes a little bit confused about photovoltaic cells, so let me just uh, give you a quick indication of how they work. Uh, you have light coming in, you create electrons and holes, you want to keep the electrons and holes, you want to let them build up to a high density, but you don't want them to see the exterior surfaces. And so uh, the way people eventually figure out you do this the same way you do with the computer chips is you coat the silicon with silicon dioxide and you follow the exact uh, correct recipe uh, for um, uh, growing the silicon dioxide. And then there, there are very few dangling bonds at that surface. And this is also a type of double heterostructure in the sense you have a small band gap of silicon, but then you have a wide band gap on the outside of silicon dioxide. But people didn't think of it as a double heterostructure because the silicon dioxide did not conduct electricity. Instead, they made little pinholes in the silicon dioxide and brought out the electricity that way. In fact, all it takes to make a solar cell is then you have selective contact, so the holes go to the hole selective contact, the electrons go to the electron selective contact, and you got your voltage and you have your current, and that's pretty much uh, the, um, that's how you make a photovoltaic cell. Now, the electrons and holes being in the same volume of space, nonetheless, I, I like to drive 
my uh, physics professors crazy and tell them that there, there are two Fermi levels in a semiconductor, uh, one Fermi level for the electrons and one Fermi level for the holes, because although they are occupying the same volume of space, they each have their own uh, Fermi level. And that's what enables, it's that difference in Fermi level that enables you to get voltage out of a solar cell. So this is kind of amazing, having two Fermi levels in the same volume of space, which is, in my view, even more amazing than having two effective temperatures in the same volume of space. People used to get very excited when uh, you had the nuclear spin temperature was different from lattice temperature, but having two different Fermi levels is even more amazing. Now, you notice in this description of the operation of the solar cell that it does not require a PN junction, and that's actually true. Uh, there are ma many types of solar cells you, you dispense with the PN junction. That's sort of optional. Uh, this is a model I like uh, for the photovoltaic cell is that you have a bucket and you have uh, raindrops falling into the bucket. You want to build up as high a pressure head as possible because that ends up being voltage and uh, the flow of water uh, out of the bucket then drives a water wheel and uh, creates work. Uh, so that's how it could work, but standing in the way is uh, sidewall leakage, that's like surface recombination, and uh, leakage out of the bottom of the bucket, that's like uh, bulk recombination. And so the power is the flow times the pressure, and so you need both a high voltage and a, uh, a current flow. So this is a, a good analogy, and it also helps us to understand why we have to optimize uh, the uh, IV curve, and that is if we uh, let the uh, faucet uh, send a lot of water out, uh, then uh, you'll get a lot of current, but very little voltage. On the other hand, uh, if you close the faucet so it's only going drip, 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 it's not going to turn the water wheel, but you'll have a very high voltage, but uh, uh, almost no current. So you have to find a, a happy optimum balance between the two. And uh, that's uh, very closely related to thermodynamics, where you're, uh, uh, you're always looking for a happy medium in thermodynamics. Uh, so uh, let me mention the solar cell I've been showing is from a company that I uh, co-founded with uh, my colleague from Caltech, Harry Atwater, and it's all for devices. And that is the, the what I was holding there is the record solar cell. And uh, the record, you have to send it off to uh, uh, National Renewable Energy Lab. It's 28.8% uh, efficiency in one sun. And it, it is so close to ideal that it works even indoors. Uh, so this is the record. And the record, you can see it's kind of a big deal because for about 20 years, the record didn't change. And then for a very brief period at the beginning of this decade, it jumped up by almost 4%, which is rather unbelievable because these records are usually broken a uh, tenth of a percent of, at a time, like the, a tenth of a second for the four minute mile. Uh, but in this case, we jumped uh, 4% in efficiency. And, uh, but the entire improvement was due to uh, boosting the voltage. So this is a shockingly high voltage for gallium arsenide photovoltaics. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, reason why we did this, uh, we were able to get this incredibly high voltage, is we got extremely high luminescence efficiency. So this was a formula not written by Shockley, but inspired by his paper that's uh, 50 years old. But the idea that you get the ideal thermodynamic uh, voltage, but if you don't have 100% uh, external luminescence efficiency, you pay a price and you lose voltage. And to get that uh, very high luminescence efficiency, you have to uh, keep the electrons and holes from recombining uh, non-radiatively, which is to say keep them away from the surfaces. And that is enabled by the double heterostructure. So uh, I'll give you an idea of what's going on there. Uh, in the textbooks on photovoltaic cells, this is the usual picture. The photons come in. You produce an electron hole pair. It gets collected. And uh, that's the normal picture. The new picture. Uh, that is not yet in the textbooks, is that the, the real situation is very different. Uh, a, um, a photon comes in. Uh, it creates an electron hole pair, which immediately recombines to produce an infrared luminescent photon. Uh, that bounces around, gets reabsorbed, re and, and re-emitted, and reabsorbed, re-emitted, and finally is collected as an electron hole pair. All of this requires fantastic mirror, but also requires fantastic interfaces, which is where the double heterostructure comes in. Now, it turns out that, yes, you need a good mirror. Uh, but surprisingly, uh, you build up a very high density of infrared luminescence. So uh, in this uh, photovoltaic cell that I've been showing, 
uh, if I would take it outside, there would be one sun falling on the photovoltaic cell, but inside the very thin film of gallium arsenide, you'd have 30, 40, or 50 suns of infrared luminescence bouncing around uh, with the corresponding high concentration of electrons and holes. And it turns out, actually, it's good to lose some, some of that luminescence. That turns out, that turns out to be uh, a good indicator for a very high voltage solar cell. So it's uh, very counterintuitive that that would be the case. Now, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, fantastic rear reflector has another consequence. And, and this has to do with uh, yet another application in the future. Uh, it's called uh, thermophotovoltaics. And what it is, it takes heat radiation, Planck radiation, and it turns it into electricity. The idea is actually quite old. It dates to the uh, early days of photovoltaic cells. And uh, it says, uh, take the big photons and make electricity. But what do you do with 90% of the photons are too small? Well, if you have a good reflector on the back, so if you remember, I, I uh, said we have an excellent reflector. So we have a reflector for photons, but also for um, minority carriers. And so that reflector recycles uh, the thermal photons, the ones that are too small to be turned into electricity, recycles them to the heat source, reheats the heat source. And in this way, you can make a very efficient conversion from heat into electricity. And in fact, uh, this idea uh, was developed and a thermophotovoltaic car uh, was uh, demonstrated 20 years ago. Uh, now, the efficiency was only 20% because they, were, they hadn't figured out yet that they should be using a double heterostructure. So amazingly, the double heterostructure concept, we can see this as uh, providing uh, power to uh, hybrid uh, automobiles. So that's kind of amazing. Now, I'll mention uh, one more idea uh, for uh, using the double heterostructure, a little bit, little bit of a futuristic idea, and yet it's kind of amazing one. And uh, so I'll first ask you to think about the photovoltaic cell. Then I'll turn it backwards and turn it into an LED. And we'll see what happens. So in a photovoltaic cell, you have sunlight coming in. It's coming from all directions. And sunlight carries entropy. If you're not sure, ask an astrophysicist, because they always calculate the entropy of the photons around the star. Uh, here we're uh, near a star, and we have sunlight. And so there's a lot of entropy in the sunlight because uh, it's coming from uh, the blue sky, it's coming from all directions. Goes into the solar cell, and in a solar cell, you never get the full bang gap of the semiconductor because the, the, uh, the photons were not pure energy. The photons, uh, they had some energy, but they also carried entropy because they were going in all directions. They were coming from all directions. And so you pay a price because of the entropy. The free energy is H nu minus the entropy term. And so you get the record voltage which I just mentioned, which is slightly over 1.1 volts. And uh, so uh, interestingly, most of the entropy of sunlight has to do with all of these directions. That's, that's, and it's geometrical, actually. It has to do with the solid angle subtended by the sun in the sky. In effect, uh, the, uh, uh, if you look at the sun, you know where the sun is. But uh, then you make a photovoltaic cell that accepts light from all angles. So you've thrown away all the information about where the sun is. And that throwing away of the information is what's entropy. And so we have to, uh, we pay a price of 3 tenths of a volt. But that's okay. That's, that's still the record solar cell. Now I'm going to reverse time. So I'm reversing time. And now instead of being a photovoltaic cell, it's actually a light emitting diode. Instead of absorbing photons, it's emitting photons in all directions. And they would say, well, uh, I reversed everything. So instead of getting an output of 1.1 volts, I have an input of 1.1 volts. But I'm getting photons out at the band gap, which is uh, 1.4 volts. So the question arises, where did the extra roughly 3 tenths of a volt of energy come from? And it's kind of obvious that uh, the, the entropy had to come from somewhere because uh, these photons are very disordered from an LED. They're very disordered photons. And obviously, that entropy is coming, uh, that extra energy you need to get up to 1.4 volts is coming from uh, lattice heat of the uh, light emitting diode. So amazingly, it means that every light emitting diode it should act as a refrigerator because the uh, light emission uh, should be uh, a you know, it's, it's an LED, so it, it, there's a lot of entropy in the light emission. 
So the LED should be cold. Now, I, uh, so I have a kind of a joke. I, I ask my audience, have you, uh, the, first I check, does everyone have an LED bulb? And just about everybody has an LED bulb. Have you touched it? Do you, have you checked whether it gets cold? And of course, it does not get cold, okay? It's still warm. And uh, the reason is you're only getting three tenths of a volt of cooling, and so you need 80% efficiency. But we're getting there with LEDs. We, we have uh, already with gallium nitride, we have 80% efficiency. So we're going to have cooling. Now, you think that that's a brave new idea, but it's actually an old idea. And it uh, was actually uh, envisioned, I think, originally uh, by Shockley uh, and was uh, published by uh, a solid state theorist, Jan Tauk, uh, from Czechoslovakia in 1957. And uh, keeps getting rediscovered. The LEDs should be refrigerators. And, uh, but, uh, you know, Shockley, uh, he was very smart, and uh, he, uh, he would like to tease people how smart he was. So I became, I never knew Shockley, but I became very friendly with someone he teased uh, by the name of Al Rose. And Al Rose was a very distinguished uh, scientist and uh, 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 physicist in his own right, uh, but he would tell me what it was like in the early days. He said, in the early days, oh, the March meeting, oh, there were just two dozen of us. Uh, and uh, can you imagine this meeting with only two dozen people? And Shockley was there and I was there. And so Shockley came up and teased him with the following question. He said, I have an LED which emits photons, and uh, the photons go into a photovoltaic cell which creates electricity. The electricity comes back to the LED and drives the LED. And he says, therefore, I have a perpetual motion machine. And therefore, Al, what's wrong with that? Of course, it's almost certain he already knew the answer. No one would ask that question except to tease someone, right? And uh, so the answer is, uh, yes, it is. Well, it's not quite a, uh, a perpetual motion machine, uh, but it's a, a kind of a heat engine. You have to make up for the losses. So you have to put a little battery in here. And uh, so you end up uh, uh, taking care of the losses. But if you do that, uh, if you put a little battery in the uh, circuit to provide a little bit of energy, uh, then what will happen is the LED actually will get cold, the photovoltaic cell actually will get hot, and it will only take a small amount of electricity because you're recovering the photon energy in the uh, photovoltaic cell. So uh, that says that uh, every LED can be a refrigerator, and uh, so it's uh, kind of interesting. Uh, so let me wrap it up by saying uh, how great is a double heterostructure to ask what it cannot do? Since it's doing so much, let's say what it cannot do. Well, first of all, let's say what it can do. It gives us all the internet communication, so you cannot connect to the internet uh, without lasers, semiconductor lasers. So that's pretty good. The double heterostructure gives us lighting. Okay, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, it gives us electricity, and it'll give us more electricity in the future as the costs come down. So that's all good stuff, but now we discover the electric, uh, the, the double heterostructure, it can provide uh, the energy to, uh, to your automobile engine by this thermal photovoltaic concept and also can provide refrigeration. So it's all uh, just uh, totally amazing applications of the uh, double heterostructure. So, I, uh, and so I'm in great awe of it, and I was actually hoping to get Herb Cromer to give this talk instead of myself. Uh, Herb's a little old, and he... Uh, he uh, said, oh, you, you go ahead and do it. So uh, I think uh, we should all honor him. Thank you very much. So do we have any questions for Professor Yablonsky? There must be a very entertaining talk episode. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen such a... Uh, uh, anyone? He needs the mic. Oh. I, uh, I really loved your talk. I, I, have, uh, I was really amazed at your last slide. I have a story to tell you afterwards about Jan Tauts, okay. who I interact, interacted with when I was a graduate student at Harvard in the early 60s. Um, one thing I would kind of take you up on is on your first slide, you said everything, all the electricity is going to be generated by photovoltaics in, in, in the future. That's only if we find a way to store electricity. And Faraday and Maxwell haven't taught us how to do that yet. 
I know, no, no, I know all about batteries, and they have big problems. Yeah. But yeah. I just wanted to. So that, that is an more. excellent question. And so those of us working in photovoltaic cells, we realize we have this roadblock uh, that we need to have storage. But the storage that we need, it's not simply storage from the daytime to the nighttime. We need storage from the summertime to the wintertime. And that becomes very important. Now, seasonal storage is very hard. So the battery won't do it. Uh, so what I have been encouraging is um, uh, the development uh, of uh, uh, very inexpensive electrolysis cells. So the electrolysis cell is similar to a fuel cell, but run backwards. And it can uh, create uh, various things. Now, it obviously, it can create hydrogen. But more important than creating hydrogen is, uh, it's great. Uh, hydrogen is uh, very useful stuff. But they have recently discovered that they can create ethane from uh, doing electrolysis on carbonated water, basically soda water. And uh, if you have ethane, uh, you can get ethylene very easily by heating it up. If you have ethylene, you can, uh, uh, you can make, uh, polymerize it, and then becomes diesel fuel, and becomes gasoline, becomes everything else that's useful and that's very easy to store. So it, it's a problem, but uh, people are working on a solution. They now have electrolysis with 70% ethane uh, produced. So that, that's actually uh, quite, quite amazing. But it's a very good question. No, but it's a very good answer because in my second career at the electric, as, a, as a science fellow at the Electric Power Research Institute, I funded work in all of these areas that you just met. Uh, and Great. And all possible. Great. Thank you. Do we have another question? Um, so if not, let me uh, thank everybody uh, for coming to this very special session. If you stayed uh, through all the different talks. Uh, it's like a, a, a half a physics education all by itself. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, combined uh, with the uh, five uh, superb, superb talks we had last year and the five we had this year, uh, you could learn a lot about how physics actually is changing the world, is changing uh, the life that we live. Uh, you saw the technologies that were important for communication uh, uh, to the uh, cloud. We saw technologies for storing information in the cloud. These are like new public utilities uh, that we need connectivity. Everyone's, you know, even if you're a prisoner in jail, it's cruel and unusual punishment if you don't give them access to the internet. It's, it's become uh, that important. And once you have access to the internet, you'll want to have access to the cloud. So uh, I think uh, it's, uh, it's been terrific to organize these sessions. And uh, so you might think, I have run out of physics that changed the world, that we've done everything you could possibly do. But when we started this process, we made a list of 30 different physics breakthroughs. So we can do this four more years before we run out of physics breakthroughs. So come again next year. Thank you.